I'm Dr. Marlise Ernstheimer, lecturer in church history at the Department of Divinity in the University of Aberdeen, and this is Dr. Ken Jeffrey, a church historian and lecturer at the same university. And we will give you um, a few ideas about the 1859 revival in Aberdeen, uh, which is an important part of the Northeastern church history. So uh, let's start with the first question. Ken, what's the revival? Uh, a revival um, is, a, is a really interesting religious movement that descends upon a community and that arouses a particular kind of spiritual anxiety um, among people um, that gives them a, a concern about the welfare of their spirits or of their soul. Um, as a result of that, many people then um, turn to the Christian faith and to, to Jesus Christ in particular, who they identify as being uh, a person who can relieve them of their anxiety or their spiritual distress. Um, and afterwards, um, through trusting in him, they receive peace and hope um, and the gift of a, of a new life. That's basically what, what conversion is. Um, and a revival is a, a period of time when there are multiple conversions, when lots of people become Christians um, in, a, in a city or in a place. Um, beyond that, however, may I explain that there are uh, at least three different uh, traditions of revival. Revivals typically began sometime um, around the 17th century, and the earliest tradition of revival is what we might describe as the Presbyterian model. It was often uh, built around communion seasons, which were um, periods of uh, four or five days when whole communities would gather to celebrate the sacrament. And often revivals would coincide with those holy fairs that took place. That tradition lasted for about 150 years or so until the end of the 18th century, start of the 19th century when with the rise of Methodism um, and uh, Baptist and Congregational churches, there was a, a second revival tradition. It was much more colorful, intense. Um, it was a, a tradition of revival that was built around um, meetings and uh, was often accompanied by very strange and colorful physical manifestations. Uh, people would often fall over or become unconscious for a long time. Um, it was a, a very peculiar kind of revival. And then into the 19th century, uh, a third tradition of revival emerged, really came out of America um, as a result of a work of a man called Charles Finney. Um, it was the, the precursor of the Moody and Sankey tour uh, in the 1870s, Billy Sunday and Billy Graham in the 1950s. And it was really um, much more like a, a modern evangelistic crusade, um, highly organized, um, not at all spontaneous, but um, often held in, in large halls or in football stadiums. Um, and that's what we might understand to have been the, the third distinct tradition of revival. Originally at the start, uh, revivals would have been understood to have been spontaneous um, movements that uh, were attributed directly to the Spirit of God. They were God's work. But increasingly, and during the 19th century in particular, uh, people began to think that there was a science behind revival, maybe as the result of the influence of the Enlightenment. But people began to think that revivals were something that people could organize, even plan, um, advertise in advance. Um, and so there was that slight shift um, as well. And finally, in response to your, your question, um, Isa, there are, are different interpretations of revival as well. Um, up until about the 1950s, uh, most of the revival scholars were, were ministers or religious people, and they were very happy simply to think that revivals were the work of God. Um, and then E.P. Thompson, Hobbes Bond, other people from the 50s and 60s fo um, further forward began to think that you could explain revivals by analyzing economic or political or social history. Um, they would often seek to attribute these remarkable movements to, to secular forces. Um, but still, and within these movements, there is something um, distinctly, um, uh, not, not strange exactly, but um, scholarship today would, 
recognize that um, they simply cannot be explained away by saying it was because of economics or society or, or a political movement. There is something distinctly spiritual uh, about these movements. Uh, okay, so thanks. So, so there was a, a long tradition of revivals in Scotland. Yes, there has been a, um, a fairly long tradition um, stretching back, uh, I suppose, to the, the first recognised revival in Scotland took place at Stewarton near Irvine um, around about 1625. It became known as the Stewarton Illness because people felt that people were becoming ill um, because there were so many conversions. After that, there was shots in Lanarkshire around about 1630. Um, then there was a, um, a silence for about 100 years until Cambus Lang, 1742, and then um, beyond Cambus Lang, another movement emerged around Moulin, near Pitlochry, around 1798. And then they appeared to move up towards the islands and the highlands, and so we've got movements in Arran, 1804, Skye, 1812, and then Lewis, 1824 to 35. And then they moved back in to the um, lowlands, I suppose, in a, in a sense. We've got Kilsyth, Dundee, up into Perth, Aberdeen, around 1840. We've got the big one, 1859, which um, we'll speak about in a moment. And then after that, we've got Moody and Sankey, 1870s. We've got a Murray Firth revival in 1921. We've got Lewis again in the 1940s. And we've got Billy Graham in 1955 at Kelvin Grove in Glasgow. So stretching back, yeah, quite a, a rich tradition uh, of um, revival in Scotland. Oh, it, it surprises me that it goes back to 1625, actually, I must say. Yep. So, so what circumstances gave rise to the revival that took place in Aberdeen in 1859? Well, um, interestingly, um, despite the fact that people would say that there were economic reasons behind it or whatever, there is no evidence to suggest whatsoever that there was either an economic or a social or a political reason why Aberdeen was affected by a revival in 1859. Rather, most people would look to the, what we might describe as the religious or the spiritual climate in the city at that time, and uh, there they might find the particular cause or reason for this movement. Um, the 1850s had become, for the Free Church, um, a decade of evangelism. The Free Church, of course, had emerged after the disruption in 1843. Uh, but within about um, five or six years, they were beginning to, to struggle a little bit. Um, they weren't growing as significantly as they hoped they would. And so in the 1850s, they, they called that a decade of evangelism. And so much effort um, and many resources were, were put into to mission um, and into to mission work. The Aberdeen City Mission itself was in fact formed in 1854, which was another significant moment um, in the history of the city. Uh, the YMCA was created in 1858. It was um, the Young Men's Christian Association. Um, and in many ways, they became the leaders of the revival that came upon the city in 1859. More specific to 1859 itself, um, in the two years preceding the revival, uh, the city was visited by a number of itinerant evangelists. These were often gentlemen, um, not ordained, laymen, um, among them uh, a guy, a man called Brownlow North, um, and he and other people would come to the city and they would organize special meetings, um, and, uh, and they took place. But perhaps most significant of all was the, was the news of another revival. In 1858, uh, a very significant revival began in New York, in America. And uh, soon news of that revival came across the Atlantic um, in telegrams and in letters um, from Scots who lived in America would send home letters to their family and friends in Aberdeen telling them about this remarkable movement. And somehow or other, this news captured the imaginations of people. They began to really desire revival. They began to expect, even to anticipate, that something was coming across the Atlantic uh, and that it would soon come to, to Britain. Um, and so as a result of the, uh, this news, um, there were more prayer meetings created, uh, there were more rallies organized, and generally the, the atmosphere, the, the, the anticipation in the city got ramped up more and more, that something was going to happen. It was just a, a matter of when. And the actual um, circumstance itself, it's, 
it's quite, um, quite a lovely story. Reginald Radcliffe was a, a, a lawyer from Liverpool, but he was an itinerant evangelist, and he was invited by people to come to Aberdeen to preach. But when he arrived um, in Aberdeen, um, the churches wouldn't welcome him. Um, they, they wouldn't allow him into their pulpits. And uh, so he, he waited for a few weeks to find out what he was going to do. And in the end, um, he was allowed to speak to children, but not to adults. And so um, one, one afternoon in November 1858, he, he led a, a meeting for children in a congregational mission room in Albion Street, and uh, at the end of that meeting, um, something descended uh, among the children and they all remained behind after the meeting and they asked Reginald Redcliffe how they might become a Christian. And so they had a conversion experience. They went home and told their parents. Um, their parents became interested. Um, and out, out of that one meeting and the mass conversion of a group of children, this movement then was ignited and spread like wildfire then right across the city. All right, then what, what, what went on afterwards? So how did this revival go on? Well, it, it's, um, it's, it's an interesting movement, um, Isa, because it, it ebbs and it flows. Um, there are periods of, of significant intensity um, and then moments when, when it seems to die down. But there were at least three periods of intense activity, certainly within the, the Aberdeen um, revival. As I said, it began with this children's meeting yes. in um, uh, Albion Street in November 58, and then it raged for about three months. Um, meetings every day, meetings for sailors, for prostitutes, for, for young men, for young women, often targeted to specific groups of people. But for about three months, the city was just enveloped in, um, in, in this remarkable movement. Hundreds of people, thousands of people crowding into the music hall, going down to the beach um, to open air meetings. And, um, and then Radcliffe burnt himself out. Um, after four months, he was just physically exhausted by his um, exertions. And so he, he left the city for a while. And with his departure, the movement went into a, um, a slight period of decline. Interestingly, at the same time, the revival then sparked off in Port Nocky, Fenecti, and Portese along the Mary Firth. Yes. And a, another wave of revival began to affect the fishing villages. It lasted quite a short time. It was a relatively short-lived experience. But then in the summer of 1859, um, the revival in the city entered a second phase and it raged for about another three or four months. At that time, particularly based around open air meetings held at the beach, that's where many, many people um, were converted. Then it went quiet again for a few months, and then its final period of intense activity was in the late spring, early summer of 1860, when Radcliffe came back to the city again. Activity began to decline gradually, and by about 1861, um, that great enthusiastic fire of excitement had gradually died down, and, and the embers glowed quietly in the hearth. But... Um, Three distinct periods, organized principally, as I mentioned before, by young men. The YMCA had, um, had just been created, um, and so it, it, was a, it was a very organized revival. It was a, a precursor, if you like, of the Moody Sankey, Billy Sunday, mm -hmm. Billy Graham kind yeah. of revival, um, based around large meetings, and um, yep, very orderly, very sober, um, but very interesting. All right, who, who was most affected by this revival? I mean, you have already mentioned the children yeah. and different groups within the, within the population, like sailors and prostitutes, who, who, but, but who were the main people, actually, who were affected by, by, by the, the main group of people who, who were affected by, by this revival? People under 30, mostly. Mm -hmm. um, about 90% of converts were under 30 okay. years of age. So um, children and young people, um, a disproportionate number of men were affected. Typically, in a revival, um, it would be two-thirds women con converts, one-third men. Um, that was the typical ratio. But in Aberdeen in 59, it was uh, almost 55% men, 45% women. And so there was a disproportionate number of men converts, largely because the revival was very much targeted at young businessmen. All right, okay. And did this revival have a lasting impact? 
uh, what was it? What were the results actually after 1861? I suppose the the real fruits, I suppose, were really felt to, throughout the rest of the 19th century, and, and principally in in the missionary movements, um, not just local but overseas, um, as. Um, People like Robert Laws and others from Aberdeen went and established missions in Malawi and right across the world. There was a, a great impulse given to the worldwide mission movement through this revival. Um, locally, interestingly, um, statistics suggest that there were fewer prostitutes working in Aberdeen. Uh, there were fewer pubs in Aberdeen. Um, drinking habits were affected um, by the revival. And I guess significantly, churches grew um, there were many, many more churches, um, and churches were, were larger and fuller than they had been previously. All right, that's interesting, actually. So, so, and then afterwards, it did appear elsewhere as well. You already mentioned them up in up northeast, yep. but yeah. So, yep, from uh, Aberdeen, it went up to the Mary Firth, uh, yep. it went into Bankery, Huntley, and then spread right across the northeast, um, almost simultaneously. Well, well, not quite simultaneously. It, it began in Ulster in, in March yes. 59, and from Ulster it came across to Ayr and to the southwest. Um, and then so it began around our sort of spring of 59, but certainly by the end of 59, practically the whole of Scotland had been embraced by this revival. All right, okay. So, and, and now if we kind of make, kind of jump forward. So, so what was the ecclesiastical situation over here after the revivals and in the early 20th century? So did it kind of fizzle out or what happens in the 20th century? Well, it, it, it fizzles out to an extent, but then, as I said, Moody and Sankey come in the 1870s and, and that keeps it alive. You've got to remember that um, revival now becomes a part of people's imagination. Um, it becomes a part of their lived experience. And so there's an anticipation that these events will occur again and again. Um, so as I mentioned, 1921, the Mary Firth gets a big revival. Um, another revival in, in Lewis in 48, 49. And then Billy Graham comes in 55 to Kelvin Grove in Glasgow. Um, so th there is that tradition. Since Billy Graham though, of course, he came back in the 1990s, and then his son came in, in the early noughties. But um, certainly, as, as we haven't experienced the same kind of movement in, in more recent times, so these stories um, no longer become a part of our lived experience. Um, and therefore, interest and even awareness of these strange but wonderful movements um, might gradually get lost. That's why, okay. Thank you very much. Thank you.